Good evening and welcome to uh, TI Office Hours. Um, this is an AP Statistics edition. Um, I'm your host, Curtis Brown. I work with uh, TI and I'm here with Josh Tabor, Darren Starnes and Robin Polson. They're gonna share some really great information with us tonight. Um, again, I just want to, um, I just want to make sure that I put out there that, man, we're just, we're just so sad that we're all in this position, um, having to do this this way and having to, to communicate in these, in these ways. Um, we're happy that we can do it, um, but we're, we're, just, we're just broken for um, all of you out there who are, are trying to teach during this time. It's an incredibly difficult time to try to prepare your students for an AP exam, prepare your students um, for the next step. Um, you know, seniors are missing their, their graduations and all kinds of things are, are, are really um, just, it's making it very, very difficult. And so um, first I want to express my, um, my gratitude to you teachers um, and to you students who are um, pushing on through this time. Um, and then also just, uh, I, I'm so sorry that we're having to do it this way. Um, Josh, I think we've got some great content tonight. So I'm gonna let you go ahead and get started. Um, and take it away. Great, thanks Curtis. Um, so uh, what we're gonna do uh, to kick this off uh, is review some of the information that we presented uh, two weeks ago uh, at the previous office hours. Um, and then we're gonna go through uh, another new question that we created. Of course, take lots of questions and things like that. Uh, but here are some important logistics uh, that both teachers and students really need to know. Um, the AP Statistics exam is on Friday, May 22nd. 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so that means you have to adjust uh, for whatever time zone you're in. Here in Arizona, we don't observe daylight savings time. So uh, there's been a little bit of confusion, but just it's absolutely at 2 p.m. Eastern. And so subtract accordingly or add accordingly to figure out when your time is. Um, it is open book, open notes and open internet searches. Um, but I wouldn't count on having too much time to spend looking at those resources. Uh, I imagine that um, they're going to try and ask as many questions as possible uh, in the time frame that they have. Uh, so I would doubt that students would have much time to look anything up online uh, or in their book or in their notes. And in fact, um, the College Board has stated that they're trying to write items uh, that aren't Googleable. Uh, so um, spending a lot of time doing that is probably not a productive um, use of your time. Now the exam. Uh, can be accessed on a smartphone, tablet, laptop, desktop, anything that has internet access. Uh, but what's really important is that you must download and upload the solutions from the same device. So if you download uh, the questions or log in and get the questions on your laptop, uh, you can't submit your answers on your smartphone. You have to submit it from the same laptop that you uh, downloaded the questions from. Now they've told us some things about the structure of the exam. Uh, they told us it's two free response questions. Question one is 25 minutes, uh, and it's about 55% uh, of the exam weight. Uh, you get five minutes then to upload uh, your question, and then it's done. You can't uh, upload it. So if you wait too long to upload it, um, then you're not going to get scored on question one. Uh, question two then will open for 15 minutes, and then you'll have five minutes to upload question number two. And that's about 45% of the exam weight. Uh, so it says at the bottom here, students may use more than one device. Um, that is, if they want to um, download the questions uh, onto a laptop, so they can be looking at the laptop, write it out on paper, take a photo with your smartphone, then you have to send that photo from your smartphone to your laptop because you have to submit it from the same device that you uh, downloaded the questions from. Um, ideally, you maybe download them on a screen that's a little bit bigger than a smartphone, so it's really easy to see. Uh, the details of the questions. Now, the good news is uh, on April 28th, the College Board has stated that they will have uh, live uh, videos um, and examples and opportunities to practice this download upload process so that students will feel very comfortable, hopefully very comfortable uh, in advance of the exam. Nobody wants the, the technical issue um, to be part of the, the what we're measuring with the test. So. Uh, if you're a teacher, please encourage your students to do that practice once it becomes live on the 28th. Now, some details specifically about the AP Statistics exam. Uh, covers content from units one through seven in the course and exam description. 
Basically what that leaves out is all the chi-square procedures as well as inference for the slope of a regression line. Each free response question will assess multiple content areas and core skills. Uh, we tried to model that with the two questions that we uh, developed for the previous office hours, uh, as well as the question we developed for this office hours. Um, speaking of the previous one, uh, make sure and take a look at that if you haven't already. Uh, it should be very nearby uh, where you found the link to this, uh, this video. There's no investigative task on this year's AP exam. Uh, when the first question was announced that it was 25 minutes, that's typically what an investigative task takes. Lots of people were worried about that, uh, but they've said definitively there will be no investigative task on this year's exam. In other words, the kinds of questions that would show up on number six on the free response question will not be asked on this year's exam. There is an updated formula sheet and tables, uh, like your normal table and t-table and chi-square table. It's unclear how much you might need to use that, uh, but they've definitely stated that students should have access to that or print it out before the exam. So teachers, please encourage your students to do that well before the exam in case they have trouble with a printer or maybe don't have access to a printer. Make sure that students have that um, ready so that's not a stress on test day. And now something we wanted to quote exactly, because uh, this is very different than previous year's uh, AP exams. It says, questions on the 2020 AP statistics exam are designed such that required calculations can be done with a paper and pencil um, with no calculator, including one with graphical or statistical capabilities. Uh, however, use of a calculator is allowed and may be helpful. So you'll see with the questions that we've developed, we tried to keep that in mind uh, and make any calculations very simple. Um, or in most cases, uh, we've done the calculations for the students and they have to use that information uh, to either interpret or explain or make decisions, something like that. So that's what we suspect might be true. Now, for official information, we've tried to do a good job summarizing it, uh, but there's no better source than the College Board for official information on this. Uh, so you see the website there, apcoronavirusupdates.collegeboard.org. That's going to be your go-to place for the final word on all of this stuff. Hey, Josh. Yeah. I do have, um, so before you get into the plan for tonight and, and kind of relating to the exam, maybe you guys are going to address this, but I did get one question just now, um, which was what happens if the two readers' um, scores do not match? So when we're scoring the exam. If you guys are going to be doing that and have any information on that, what happens when they don't match? Are they averaged? Is a third reader brought in? And do, do you know? <laughs> well, that's a great question. Um, and that's alluding to something we haven't mentioned yet on this uh, office hours, but was mentioned last time. Um, and it was something that we heard in one of Trevor Packer's webinars uh, that he referenced each item being scored by two readers. Um, so if that's true, uh, which it seems like it's true, uh, but if that's true, that's great news, I think, because with only two questions, um, you know, one point difference could make a really big difference in a student's final score. Uh, so that would be encouraging um, that it would be uh, graded by multiple people. Um, as far as the details of how that's going to work out, though, uh, they haven't said anything. Uh, in fact, um, invitations for the reading have yet to go out. Um, well, they actually went out in January. They all got rescinded. Uh, and then they're going to go out again fairly soon, I suspect. Um, and so no real details have been shared about um, the logistics of how all that's going to work. Um, so everything that I've said is mostly a speculation. Um, but hopefully we'll hear uh, some more details soon. Okay. And is that uh, College Board um, website that you shared probably the place where students will get the updated formula sheet? Probably a good place to start anyway. Uh, yeah, so this one on the, that I'm showing now here on the bottom of the slide, um, if you go there, then you'll want to look up the specific link for statistics, um, and then it'll give you details about the statistics exam, and I believe the link for the formula sheet is in there. Uh, if not, I know it's in AP Classroom. Uh, if you go to log into AP Classroom, probably from the student or the teacher view, um, there's a tab all the way on the left that says course uh, or course resources, something like that. Um, yeah. where they can also find uh, the, the tables and formulas. Okay, that's a good call. Um, one last question, it's related to your comments about the investigative task. Um, the investigative task is usually the way that the test um, kind of gets at how students can apply what they've learned to something new. Do you think the new test will try to do that or 
If so, do you, do you have any speculation on how? Uh, good question. I don't think, and again, this is just a speculation, but I don't think that they're going to try to have students do anything new. Uh, and that's because they only get two questions to try and assess, you know, seven units of things. Uh, there's just not enough time or space uh, on the exam to, um, I don't want to say waste, but there's not enough time to ask those sorts of questions when there's so many really important questions within the first seven units that, you know, need to be asked or should be asked. That being said, another characteristic of the investigative task is that it often asks kids to make connections across the curriculum. Um, and that I think we are going to see uh, in the questions uh, that are on this year's exam, because there's, you know, only two questions and seven units and um, four different skill types. Um, there have got to be connections, you know, multiple skills and multiple parts of the course assessed in that one item or in each item. Uh, so I think we will see some connections, uh, more integrated types of questions than maybe uh, we're used to seeing. Okay. And Darren just made me aware that the formula sheet and tables are available from the uh, College Board website that you've got mentioned here. So um, that is uh, the right path to go to get that new updated uh, formula sheet. So um, thanks a bunch, Josh. Um, I'll let you go ahead and get started. Right. Great. Well, thank you for these questions. I mean, that's why we're here and why it's called office hours to, uh, to be able to try and answer as many questions as possible. All right. So the plan, uh, we're going to share a third free response question uh, that we created uh, based on uh, information about this year's exam. Uh, of course, solutions to that question also. So you see third, Again, we did two previous questions on the, uh, the earlier edition of Office Hours, so you can make sure and check those out. Uh, we're gonna try and highlight adjustments that we made from previous year's free response questions uh, in case you wanna try creating your own. And I've already given away one of the things we tried to do, which is uh, instead of having a question just about inference or just about regression, uh, we tried to stretch it so it covers multiple different topics in the same question. Uh, but you'll see some other modifications. We'll try and point those out as we go. Uh, we'll show briefly how the TI-8384 uh, family, as well as the TI-Inspire family, can be used to do the analysis for this question. Now, make sure and hear this. You don't need those calculators specifically on this year's exam. Uh, so this is more for teachers. If you're trying to develop your own questions um, for practice this year, uh, we're going to show you how you can use the TI technology to make that happen. Of course, for future years, uh, this is something that uh, we would expect kids to be able to do. Uh, on the AP exam. So if you're watching this for the 2021 exam, uh, then these TI tips can definitely be helpful for students uh, as they face uh, an exam a year from now. All right, and of course, answer your questions. And then as a disclaimer, uh, we don't have any inside knowledge. Uh, TI doesn't, Darren and I don't. We don't have any inside knowledge about um, what's gonna be on the exam uh, or any of the specifics about how it's graded, uh, but, like everyone else, we enjoy speculating. Uh, and there's been some great discussions on the AP teachers community about the types of questions that could be asked. Uh, and many teachers have volunteered uh, questions that they've created, oftentimes by taking an existing free response question uh, and adding a couple parts that, you know, go backwards to the collecting data stage or go forwards into scope of inference or probability, different things like that. So I encourage you to spend some time on uh, the AP teachers community uh, looking for the threads about um, example questions. All right, so speaking of speculations, uh, it's unlikely that students will need to calculate test statistics, p-values, confidence intervals, things like that on this year's exam. It's more likely that those values will be provided. Uh, and we illustrated that uh, on our previous session with office hours on the questions we did then. It's also very likely that each of the two items will cover different units or themes of the course. Uh, for example, uh, an inference question with parts about design, exploring data, and probability. Uh, based on the 55-45% weighting that the College Board has announced, uh, it's possible question one could have five parts and question two could have four parts, uh, with each part equally weighted in the scoring. Um, so that would work out to be roughly 55-45%. Uh, and so what follows is one possibility for question one on the real exam. That is a five-part question. Uh, that covers a variety of different topics. And remember, these are just speculations. So we don't know for sure that the first question is going to have five parts and the next question is going to have four parts. It could be six and five, for example, and you get that same rough 55-45% ratio. 
So these are just speculations, but we hope that they're helpful. All right, so here is the question we'd like to work through. Um, and again, uh, we'll take some questions along the way uh, if Curtis has them uh, and certainly have time for questions at the end. So it says the Starnes family visited Yellowstone National Park in hopes of seeing the Old Faithful geyser erupt. When they pulled into the parking lot near Old Faithful, a large crowd of people was headed back to their cars from the geyser. Now uh, that's disappointing. Old Faithful had just finished erupting. The Starnes family wondered how long they would have to wait until the next eruption. Fortunately, because Darren knows a thing or two about statistics, they had collected data on a random sample of 20 Old Faithful eruptions from the previous week, including the wait time until the next eruption in minutes. That's of course what they cared about. How long are they gonna to have to wait until the next eruption? So here's a dot plot and numerical summaries of the data. Part A says, Mr. Starnes decides that there is time for the family to go and see the bubbling mud pots, which will take 70 minutes. Based on this sample of 20 eruptions, estimate the probability that the Starnes family will miss the start of the next eruption. That is, estimate the probability that the wait time is less than 70. Now, what you can see here is we've got uh, one variable data, and there's lots of questions we could ask about this data set. Uh, but we also wanted to think about ways to integrate probability uh, in a way that wasn't gonna involve really difficult calculations. Uh, so you can see when I put the solution up here, it's not too complicated. Uh, of the 20 data values that uh, they collected, three of them were less than 70. So our estimate of the probability is three out of 20 or 15% or 0.15. So before we move on to the, the next question, I wanted to point out a couple of tips. One is if a student only put 0.15 down on their paper, it's very unlikely that they would get full credit. Uh, the directions for the free response questions say, show all your work. Uh, so at the reading, we talk about no naked answers. You can't have just an answer without any supporting work. Well, in this case, there's not a whole lot of supporting work to give, but circling those three dots on the graph is a great start. And then writing the fraction three over 20 uh, is also a, a great way to show where that number comes from, that 15%. So make sure you always show some work, uh, no matter how simple the calculation might be. Also, um, I was just gonna say, um, don't be surprised if part A of the first question is fairly easy. Lots of times uh, test writers will try and start with some easy questions and build up to harder questions uh, to make sure that questions are accessible to uh, different students of different abilities. All right, Curtis, it sounded like you had a question. I do, um, and it's related to what you were just talking about. Um, we got a question from Ed Donahue um, asking if this will be the year for um, half points um and pressuring you to to make a guess um and uh it's been of course speculated on the on the conversation still um that it was an epi probably going to stay the same kind of thing and i i would guess the same but i'm going to ask you guys to maybe weigh in on that uh yeah so it's i think it's been officially announced that um on the last webinar with trevor packer that statistics will be sticking with the epi sort of grading for each component or each part of the question. Um, but I think what Ed's question was, you know, at, at the reading, say if we had a four part question and it was E, P's and I's, sometimes right. you might end up at a two and a half, uh, but we weren't allowed to bubble a two and a half. We have to bubble a two or a three. And we look holistically at the response to see whether it was more developing uh, and get a two or more substantial and get a three. Um, so again, no details have been announced about this. Um, just speculation. And so I think because there's a 25 minute question and because of the 55, 45% uh, weighting, um, I wouldn't be surprised if we moved out of the zero through four scale uh, for at least question one. Um, and there's also been some speculation that if you only use integer values, then scores would be maybe from zero to nine. Um, and that would make it, you know, harder to um, split the scores up into one, two, three, four, five at the end. So there's been some speculation that uh, there might be half points. And so you might can get seven and a half out of nine or six and a half out of nine or something like that. Um, I don't know. I can see reasons both ways. One of the nice things about using integers only is that you get more consistency um, from reader to reader. 
um, the more um, finely you grade, uh, the more chances there are of a discrepancy um, in the grades from one reader to the next. So there's a real sure. balance of um, precision and consistency. And so um, I'll be curious to find out yeah. how that goes. I like that. One more question on this here. Sure. Uh, I think I know the answer, but I want to hear yours. Um, what if a student only wrote three over 20 um, and did not give the decimal response there? Uh, both in the past, and I'm certain for this year, that three out of 20 would be a full credit answer. Um, I expected that too. Okay. Yeah, it's the 0.15 that would be, you know, a little bit questionable about whether that would get full credit. Um, but sure. it's always been the case in the past that three out of 20, like that fraction, um, would be full credit. Uh, and even, you know, some math teachers would be crazy, even if they had, you know, if it, if it, in the, say it was four out of 20, a kid could leave it as four out of 20 instead of reducing it to one out of five. Um, yeah. So, in fact, we, pre we prefer you don't reduce it so you don't mess up on that sort of arithmetic um, step. All right, let's move to part B. I know Darren's itching to go, so he's going to take over with part C. I'm going to finish up here with part B, though. It says, uh, again, here's the data says uh, the Z score for a wait time of 51 minutes is Z equals negative 2.56. Interpret this value. So a quick timeout, thinking about how this question would look in previous years. Um, in another year, this question would have most likely said, calculate and interpret the Z score for the wait time of 51 minutes. Uh, but here, we don't want students to have to divide by 9.54 uh, if they're only using a paper and pencil. Um, so this is one of those cases where this question this year um, might look a little different than it would look like in other years. Um, but certainly it's possible they could ask you just to interpret it um, in other years as well. But that's one of the things that we were conscious of when we were writing this item, uh, is to make sure that a student who was only using paper and pencil uh, would not be disadvantaged in any way. And I think the College Board is really concerned about that um, equity uh, for all students. And so. Um, that's how I think these kinds of questions would look. So anyway, here's the answer. Uh, says the wait time uh, was 2.576, pardon me, 2.56 standard deviations less than the mean wait time. So that's a very common uh, thing to do is to interpret a z-score. There's actually a lot of ways that students can go wrong. Uh, one really common mistake kids would make on a question like this is they would say the wait time is 2.56 standard deviations from the mean wait time instead of less than. So the negative on the z-score gives us a direction. So the interpretation needs to have a direction. Another common mistake that students make, or at least that my students make, uh, is they wanna say minutes. This wait time was 2.56 minutes less than the mean wait time. But we remember that z-scores are called standardized scores. They don't have units other than the units of standard deviations. Uh, the final thing that students can really get messed up on uh, is context. Uh, almost all, well, in fact, all interpretations and descriptions and explanations need to be in context. So then in this case, that means using the variable name, wait time. You can see that that's included twice in my model solution. Um, but here's an example um, where it's not the case. Uh, this dot is 2.576 standard deviations below the mean. That would not get full credit uh, because it's not in the context of this question uh, where it uses the variable name. So even though it seems like a very simple question to interpret a z-score, there's lots of ways that students mess this up. All right, let me uh, stop sharing my screen now and Darren is gonna take over and lead us through uh, the rest of the question. Oh gee, you caught me looking at old faithful photos. Sorry about that. What a coincidence. Uh, I'm actually gonna say one more thing about um, this slide, if that's all right. I can also picture a student going wrong by thinking about normal distributions and seeing that z-score and maybe looking at their handy dandy table of standard normal probabilities and looking up the probability or area to the left of that z-score and trying to use that as part of their answer. But if you look at the data distribution here, there's nothing normally distributed going on and so I think one common misconception students have shown uh, in the past is that a z-score is somehow connected to a particular type of distribution. 
Uh, and some of that comes from the inference procedures we do later in the course, but uh, we don't want them doing it here uh, for sure. All right, uh, let's take a look at um, the next part of the question. Um, and I wanna let you know the this particular problem is based on a real life story involving people I know. Um, and I'm sad to say that Mr. Starnes really did take his family to the bubbling mud pots and the family really did not make it back in time. So we got to watch everybody coming away from the geyser a second time. I'll tell you what happens uh, next at the end. So the question now is, um, would knowing the duration of the most recent Old Faithful eruption help the Starnes family predict the wait time until the next eruption? So using data on both of these variables from the random sample of 20 Old Faithful eruptions, Mr. Starnes performed a linear regression analysis. Here are a scatter plot with the least squares regression line, a residual plot, and computer output from the analysis. Looks like this is standard output from uh, Minitab software. And here's the question, part C. The Starnes family learns that the previous eruption lasted less than three minutes. Based on this fact and the positive association displayed in the scatter plot, do you think the probability that the wait time is less than 70 will be less than, greater than, or about the same as your answer from part A? Justify your answer. So instead of just focusing on the one variable, the wait time, now we're looking at the relationship between duration as the explanatory variable and wait time as the response variable. So we're curious if that extra information about the duration of a previous eruption will help us with predicting the wait time until the next one. So this is a very different type of question than we usually see asked uh, in a scatter plot situation. We have to think about the fact that the previous eruption lasted less than three minutes. So we're gonna be over on the left-hand side of the scatter plot somewhere, and we're being asked about what we think will uh, be the case in terms of the wait time. So here's a possible model solution. The probability that the wait time is less than 70 should be greater than 0.15. In this positive association, smaller values of duration are typically paired with smaller values of wait time. And because we're told that the duration value is small, less than three minutes, it's more likely to get a small wait time. So that's not good news for the Starnes family. Probably should have thought to look at this relationship before making the decision to go to the bubbling mud pots, uh, but I looked at it afterwards. And that's when I figured out my mistake was bigger than I thought. All right, over to part D. I just want to know, oh, yeah, go ahead, Chris. before you get started on that, how, yeah. many, uh, how many parents carry around the uh, relationship between the uh, eruption time and the and the wait time between uh, Old Faithful responses such that they could have looked that up? You know, um, I'm sure a lot of people do. <laughs> At least one. Um, more more on that. curious. Yeah, more, more on that later, perhaps, when I tell you what happened uh, at the end of the story. All right, part D um, is to estimate and interpret the residual for the eruption at 2.2 comma 51. That's the one down in the bottom left hand corner of the scatter plot. Okay, so that's a fairly unusual point in some sense uh, relative to the rest of the, uh, the points in the cloud up there. So here's a possible model solution. From the residual plot, the eruption with a 2.2 minute duration, and I'm eyeballing it here, has a residual of about negative five. The actual wait time for this eruption was about five minutes less than the predicted using the least squares regression line with X equals duration of the previous eruption. So uh, the prediction was a little bit uh, too, uh, high, we over predicted by about five minutes. Well, I wonder if you see where this question's going. We're sort of focusing on this unusual point a lot. Um, and hey. you might remember back in part A that we also uh, were thinking about 70 minutes. And then in part B, we were thinking about uh, 51 minutes. Well, this is the one that was 51 minutes. But back then we didn't know anything about 
durations of previous eruptions or this relationship. Um, Darren, I do have one question here. Sure. Um, and that was, uh, it's kind of related to um, your question. The three minute uh, eruption was the previous eruption. How does that help predict the future? Can you just go back through and make sure everybody, we've got um, your data straight here for us? Yeah, so I, I think uh, in this one, we were, we were talking about um, the previous eruption um, when all the people were coming away from the geyser, we knew it lasted less than three minutes. And so we wanted to figure out based on that, if that would have affected our decision to go see the bubbling mud pots, if we had known about this um, length of the previous eruption and this relationship. And in, in fact, it would have because the probability uh, that we would miss the eruption uh, would be uh, uh, a lot great. Well, it would be greater than 0.15. I suspect it would have been a lot greater, in which case uh, Mrs. Starnes would have said, we're not doing that. We're going to wait on this next eruption. So the, uh, so the durations are the previous uh, yes. and the wait times are to the next one. Yes. Thank you for clarifying that. Just wanted to be sure. I, we got a couple questions around. Yep. No, that's a good, good clarification and thank you for doing it. So it's duration of the previous eruption and wait time till the next eruption. Um, my very simple scientific um, mind explained it as follows. It seems like if the geyser went off for longer, then it might take it longer to refill its tank to go off again. That is the end of my scientific explanation. There are others who can do way better than that. So let's, uh, let's finish the uh, problem with this part E. We've been talking about this uh, unusual uh, eruption uh, that was fairly short. 2.2 minutes, and uh, the wait time until the next eruption was 51 minutes. Um, and we've looked at it in this bivariate situation, and we also looked at that point earlier in the univariate situation on the dot plot. And the question here says, explain why the point in part D should be classified as an outlier when considering wait time alone, but not when considering both duration and wait time. Ooh, that's a good question. This is, a, a, I don't think we've seen a question like this before. I don't remember one uh, in the history of the exam, but it's thinking about the data in a slightly different way. So in the one variable case, that was part B, we said that the eruption with a 51 minute wait time should be uh, maybe classified as an outlier because it is more than two standard deviations below the mean. Uh, it was uh, negative uh, 2.56. So it's 2.56 standard deviations below the mean. That's pretty far for a value to be from the mean in any distribution. Um, I'm not assuming anything about the shape of the distribution because that would be dangerous. So being more than two standard deviations from the mean is actually a criteria that the course and exam description specifies as an alternative way to identify outliers in a one variable uh, quantitative data set. Uh, it's not the one I usually use with my students. I usually use the 1.5 times interquartile range, but this is an alternative method uh, that some people uh, use, two standard deviations or three standard deviations away from the mean. So we would consider that value um, as a potential outlier based on that criterion. It would be an outlier because it's farther than two standard deviations from the mean. However, let's look at this point in the bivariate situation up here on the scatter plot. It's actually not very far from the regression line. And if you look at the course and exam description carefully, uh, the definition of an outlier in a two variable quantitative situation requires that that point have a large residual relative to other uh, values in the data set. And this point does not have a large residual. Its residual was around negative five. But if you look at the residual plot, there are plenty of other points with much bigger residuals. So this point's actually fairly close to the line. Now we can talk about that a little bit. Why is it so close to the line? Well, that point is somewhat influential on the slope of that line. It, it's going to pull that line down toward it. It's going to have a lot of leverage. Uh, so we could say that this is uh, an influential point on the slope of the regression line because it's going to pull the line downward toward it and make the slope more positive. Or we could say it's a high leverage point because it's really far from the mean x value in the data set. Uh, it's very far down to the left, and so it's a high leverage point by that definition. 
but it's not an outlier according to the course and exam description because it has a fairly small residual. Uh, so we thought this would be a nice opportunity to talk a little bit about those terms, high leverage point, meaning far from the uh, X mean, um, influential point, influential on what? Influential on the slope is what I was talking about. And the fact that this point is not an outlier. Uh, we gave a little quantitative description here. We can tell that that point should not be classified as an outlier because if you look up here at the computer output, the standard deviation of the residuals is 6.63. So this particular point is not even one standard deviation away from the regression line as measured by the standard deviation of the residuals. So on the one hand, when you think of it just in the one variable situation, this uh, eruption looked like an outlier. When you think of it in the bivariate relationship, we would not classify this uh, particular uh, eruption as an outlier at all. So we thought okay. that was cool. That is a really great question. Uh, and I don't know if you heard me mutter that earlier when you asked it, but um, I man, that's a really cool question. Uh, there are a couple of questions coming in though, um, kind of related to this and, and maybe the earlier discussion as well. And that is, um, I'm gonna do with the second one first. Would they need to reference the standard deviation or just talking about the residual, um, would that be sufficient enough for full credit? Since you guys wrote it, you should know the answer to that. Yeah, I would, I would give credit to a student who talked about the size of that residual relative to the other residuals on the graph. Um, one way to talk about the relative size of the residual is to talk about how far away from the regression line it is based on the number of standard deviation units, but sure. another way is just to do that discussion I did at the beginning. Okay. Um, and then the uh, second question um, is this, there aren't, um, aren't the number of standard deviations useless if the data is very skewed? So talking in the single dimension here, um, going back to probably part A, um, wouldn't IQR make a better way to test to see if it was an outlier just based on the shape of the, of the um, distribution? We have a very knowledgeable person out there, I would say. Um, so I prefer the 1.5 IQR test for outliers, uh, but I will say that there was this really smart fellow called Shebyshev a long time ago that asked the question, well, I know in a normal distribution how the distribution of data values would fall about 68% within one standard deviation of the mean, about 95% within two standard deviations of the mean. Um, is there something similar for any data set? And smart old uh, Mr. Shebyshev found out that the answer was yes. Um, so in any data set, it turns out that at least 75% of the observations are within two standard deviations of the mean. So at least 75% uh, should be within there. Now, do I think that something that might be within the outer 25%-ish of the data is an outlier? I don't personally, um, but that's sort of a uh, uh, personal opinion. I might choose three standard deviations because then Mr. Shebyshev says at least 89% of the values roughly are within three standard deviations in any distribution. So there are rules like that. The problem is we don't teach them in AP statistics. So I think we can thank our science friends for this criteria. Uh, I'm in a math and science building here on my campus and I often hear the two standard deviation or three standard deviation rule coming from down the hall and it's not from my math colleagues. Uh, so I don't object to there being a criteria based on standard deviations, but I would not infer that it had anything to do with normal distributions. I like to say, ah, it's that Chevy Chev guy. Can I add a couple things to uh, Darren's discussion? Um, I think partly, um, using the z-score here was due to this year's exam um, and not wanting kids to have to do any calculations, even the 1.5 IQR rule. Uh, so giving them that um, I think was maybe peculiar for this particular year is because we wanted to give kids, um, give, give, give them the values rather than have them calculate it. Uh, and then a comment about the first question, which was, would students need to reference the standard deviation um, to get full credit in part E? Uh, and I agree with Darren, uh, as long as the kid talked about the other residuals, um, I think they would be fine. There was a question, I don't know if it was last year, maybe the year before, where they had to describe why a point was unusual on a scatter plot. Um, and if a student just said, oh, the residual is not that big, or the residual is small, 
uh, that wasn't full credit because it has to be relative to something else. Uh, and so mm -hmm. saying, oh, I noticed that there's lots of dots that have uh, bigger residuals or that are farther from the line. Now there's a reference uh, and you would get full credit for that. Uh, or of course, referring to the standard deviation, which is a summary of the typical residual. Um, so there, there needs to be at least some reference to the rest of the data uh, to get full credit for, uh, for part E. Right, and context matters, right? I mean, in this scenario, uh, a residual of five might be relatively small. A residual in some other data set of five might be huge compared to everything else. And by saying it was only five, yeah, I can see that. Thank you for that. Uh, so I, uh, we're about to switch over to taking a look at um, the tech, how we can use the technology. I'm going to show you the actual data. These are real data. Uh, I really did collect these data before we went to Old Faithful. None of that's made up. Uh, but I wanted to tell you before I forget um, uh, the way the story ended. So uh, we really did go to the bubbling mud pots. We have three boys all grown now, and boys love bubbling mud pots. Uh, it did take about 70 minutes. Uh, we did miss the next eruption of Old Faithful. And my wife took charge at that point and said, we're going to sit on this bench right in front of Old Faithful. I don't care how long it takes. We're going to wait for that next eruption. And that is exactly what we did. <laughs> That's fantastic. No, no more models, no more data, just a decision. No uncertainty. Awesome. All right, so uh, let's take a look at the actual data uh, for these uh, 20 randomly selected uh, Old Faithful eruptions from the month, or sorry, from the week before we visited. Um, I'm showing here, uh, if you want to enter the data values um, into lists, I've got the duration of the eruption in list one and the wait time until the next eruption in list two. So uh, we had this eruption that was 4.6 minutes long and the wait time till the next eruption was 80 minutes. Uh, so just using the stat editor to uh, get those in there. Uh, then wanted to make the scatter plot, always uh, plot your data. Uh, so it was a fairly simple matter. I went ahead and traced just so you could see that first uh, eruption uh, with uh, 4.6 comma 80. I did use my zoom stat because the window could have been anything before I entered these data. I wanted to calculate the regression line and I also wanted to make sure that um, my R and my R squared would show up. So I just reminded myself and all of you who might be using the 8384 to make sure your stat diagnostics are on in the mode menu. Um, ran stat calc. Uh, statisticians prefer this eight LINREG A plus BX form. Mathematicians may have other feelings. Uh, and I went ahead and stored the regression equation in Y1. And this is one of the cooler features uh, I think that's been developed uh, recently, these hot keys. Uh, so I did the alpha trace to get my hot key. Uh, I felt really, really cool uh, to get this Y1 uh, and then was able to calculate and get my R squared, my R, uh, and also to get the graph of the regression line. And then uh, to make the residual plot, just went back into my stat plot, uh, changed the Y list to resid, uh, which is automatically stored once you run the re linear regression uh, under uh, the list menu or second stat, and did a zoom nine because the residuals were quite a bit smaller than the uh, predicted wait times. And then finally, uh, some of you might be curious about how you would get the uh, rest of the computer regression output, including the standard deviation, the residuals S, uh, so I went ahead and ran linear regression t-test to get some of the other things that you saw on the computer output there, including that 6.63 number. Uh, you would have to arrow down to see uh, R squared and R. It's, it's down there somewhere. All right, I think I'm going to uh, turn it over to Robin and say a few things about how you would do it on the Inspire. Absolutely. Thanks, Darren. Um, so again, using that same data, on your Inspire with your new documents, you will want to first add a list and spreadsheets page. Uh, remembering one of the differences between 84 and Inspire is you'll want to name your lists. So I chose Dear Last and Time Next. You can choose whatever makes the most sense to you. Um, after entering your data, I'll go to the next slide, Darren, you're controlling things. Thanks. Um, you'll want to get a picture of the data. So we add another page, the data and statistics page hover near the x-axis, click to add that independent variable of your last, and then hover your mouse near your y-axis to get your time next. Um, by the way, before I forget, in 
an effort to save a little bit of time so that there's time at the end for questions, I made a video um, that goes much more slowly and carefully through using both the 84 and the Inspire for this problem. And I think Allison is going to put the link on the chat and it'll be on our website as well um, to access later. So if I go too fast because I wanna make sure that there's time for questions at the end, you can certainly access that video that has both 84 and Inspire use on it. Okay, so that gives us our scatter plot, and then we want um, the regression equation in line. So you will, on that data and statistics page, press menu, analyze, choose your linear regression, um, and that immediately gives you the line and the equation of the line. Um, to get those R and R squared values, you want to add a calculator page, um, go through your menus, choose menu statistics, calculations, linear regression, define your variables just like you would on the 84, and then that last screen shows the results of that. Again, moving quick, because there is a video out there. Um, to get the residual plot, this is interesting. You could do it one of two ways, but I just chose a new page so you could see a full picture of it. Um, again, a data and statistics page, very much like the 84. I just changed my Y um, axis to the stat resid, and there's a really nice residual plot there. And then finally, to get those extra um, analyses, you run a linear regression t-test. I did it on a calculator page going through the menus. So um, again, just for the sake of time, that's really quick, I know, but there are videos out there um, for any of you who would like some more detail. So thank you. Yeah, this is great. Um, yeah, for sure. The handouts and the questions um, will um, <laughs> will be uh, posted at the uh, end of this. They'll be in the, the chat section. Um, Allison's already posted them once there, and that'll be uh, that'll live there forever. So you can go and download both this PowerPoint um, handouts around that um, that as well, and then uh, Robin's. Uh, videos will be posted on the TI website so she are on the TI uh, on the TI YouTube channel where you found this this live uh, chat that those those videos will be there as well so you can find those um, there I've gotten a ton of just shout outs um, to go through here uh, during the time here this evening so um, continue to ask your questions though we've got Darren and Josh and, and Robin here so please um, fire them away. Um, and I know we've got a little bit of a delay here. So I just said that you've got a few few seconds to, to put those in the chat while I do these shout outs. Um, so Mimi Latorno, you um, are awesome. Uh, Ooh, Mimi, nice, yay! Uh, first Great responder. Mass insight. <laughs> um, so there's a ton of mass insight teachers on here tonight and uh, they're doing a lot of shout outs to you. Um, so definitely want to make sure that's uh, out there. Mass Insight rocks. Love taking the classes with those people in October. Um, let's see. Oh, good. Here's a question uh, that just popped up on SAT essay. Whoops. Wait a minute. Let me read this all the way through <laughs> before I read the before I shout this one out. Uh, I think this is about the scoring and whether what happens if two readers disagree. Ah, uh, yeah, that's good. Um, it's a way that the SATs are scored. Um, if there's a difference, has to be more than one point off, and then they'll send it to a senior table leader. Perhaps that's a direction that they'll go with this. We just don't know uh, on that at all. Um, yeah, good, good presentation, guys. Lots and lots of comments about that. Um, more comments about how Mimi is the best, um, and I would, I would say that um, actually, I, I just, I want to put put again out there to anyone who is trying to teach during this time, Darren, you and Josh, um, you guys teaching, and then um, all of the folks out there striving to teach their students. Uh, you guys are rock stars, um, superheroes in my opinion, trying to take your classrooms um, and turn them into virtual classrooms um, effectively overnight um, for many of you. Um, and that challenge is, is massive. And uh, we just want to make sure that we can do anything we can do to help you guys uh, be successful. So um, that said, um, please comment either in the um, in the chat section here, the comment section below this YouTube video, um, and then uh, 
or put it in our Twitter accounts or on our Instagram account. Make sure that you get your questions to us and we'll continue to try to answer questions um, as we can. Uh, Darren does have a question uh, here and that was, I need to know how long uh, the Starnes family sat and waited to see the next eruption. Was that an outlier? I, it took a really long time. It was not one of the uh, short duration followed by short wait time situations. It, it was not an outlier on the high end, but it was a long time with three restless boys who had just, you know, play with the bubbling mud pots. So another influential point. Yes. So I had a question for Josh. Uh-oh. Did, did you consider any other parts when, when you were uh, helping uh, to develop this question? Yeah, there was all kinds of things that, um, that we could have asked about. Um, I'm trying to go back in my memory banks. I mean, there's, you could ask about just describing the univariate plot. You could ask about describing the bivariate uh, scatter plot. Uh, you could ask about interpreting slope. Um, certainly interpreting um, uh, the standard deviation or R squared, we've seen that. Uh, we tried to, as best we could, um, not give as many questions that were sort of template, fill in the blank um, type responses, the kind of thing that you could quickly look up in your notes. Uh, so for instance, part C, uh, we could have asked just, uh, you know, another probability question, we could have asked them to describe the, the scatter plot. Uh, but the question we came up with about knowing that it's a positive association, how's that going to affect your uh, answer to a previous question? Uh, there's no way you can look that up in your notes um, or in a book or online or anything like that. And so um, we tried to write questions that we hope that the test writers will write to um, sort of level the playing field that way and not have um, questions or answers that are easily looked up. So um, that's good. I have one question that kind of came through. Um, it's been repeated a couple of times and that is, um, do you have any recommendations for other places they can go um, to kind of try to prepare for this year? I know College Board has kind of put out um, and given students some access to different, uh, different things. Um, can you guys talk about maybe some of the things students have access there? Um, to answer that. And then I'm going to try to read some more questions and see what else we've got. So uh, I'll kick it off. Uh, the nice folks at College Board have uh, opened up some things in AP Classroom that now have little green uh, target symbols next to them uh, that all students can access. These are uh, free response items from the past that they are opening up because they have the spirit of some of the kinds of questions that might appear this year. They're not exactly right because there are still some that require technology or heavier than paper and pencil calculations. Uh, but the fact that they've made them available to everyone inside AP Classroom is, is a really good thing. Um, and I think I saw, Josh, that a couple of other folks out there in uh, the AP teacher community are uh, developing their own items as well and, and starting to share those out. So. Uh, uh, looking on the AP teacher community might be a good, uh, a good place to go as well. I have nothing to add to that excellent response. Thanks. Okay. Those, that's good. Um, where did the, oh man, I lost a question. It was an inspire question. No, well, there was the inspire question. Oh, okay. I address that <laughs> question, uh, Robin, about why maybe doing it in a calculator page or just pointing out that you can do it in a, uh, list and spreadsheet page. Um, in yeah, um, I think the question, I, I saw it quickly come through. Why did I do the uh, R and R squared on its own calculator page instead of in a list and spreadsheet? It's honestly just personal preference. Um, when I taught in the classroom and I was teaching AP statistics, I liked to have kind of everything on its own page. Um, my students just got really good at referencing different pages. And one of the things that I loved about the Inspire is you can do anything probably three different ways and every kid will come up with what works best for them. So some kids would put the analysis right on the spreadsheet page, others would make their own calculator page. It really doesn't matter. Um, it's really just personal preference, so. Nice. And it's good to know um, that on that, if you do it in the list and spreadsheet, you can update your data, maybe play with that influential point a little bit. Yes. And see 
the impact. And you can do that on that graph page too. When you're um, looking at it, you can click, hold the point and move it around and then everything changes accordingly. So, yeah. Okay, two questions that have come up. Oh, some, there's some really good stuff. We're going all over the <laughs> questions, so this is good. Um, so first, first question that I'm gonna get to here is one that came in just now, and that is um, when adding two standard deviations uh, for events, can, you can add them uh, when both events are independent. Why is there this condition? Do you guys see that question come through? So I think this question is about um, combining random variables. Um, and those variables uh, need to be independent for you to be able to add their variances. Um, we call it the Pythagorean theorem of, uh, of statistics. Um, and, you know, I, it is true that they need to be independent. And um, like in our book, we work through an example where we take two distributions, multiply all their probabilities, assuming independence, and show that the variances uh, do in fact add. That's not a proof, that's a demonstration. Um, it's just like uh, what I tell my students is, you know, you can't use the Pythagorean theorem on just every triangle. It has to be only right triangles. And so there's a similar requirement or restriction uh, for using this formula for combining variances, which is that, um, that the events are independent or the variables are independent. So I've been following the chat, Curtis. Um, I, I wanna be sure to uh, address one thing here in terms of resources for, uh, for other good preparation. Uh, the Stats Medic website, our friends there have developed some uh, very fine AP exam preparation and uh, are really uh, well aware of the situation that everybody's in this year. Uh, yeah. So uh, I wanna put in a plug for, uh, for that as a source that I totally forgot, but a very good source. Good, yeah, I'm glad it got mentioned in the, uh, in the chat there. Um, I did see one, um, uh, several people actually have posted some questions around mosaic plots supposed to be new for 2020. What are the odds? Uh, um, I would say small. Um, I, uh, certainly students I wouldn't think would be expected to make one. Um, it's possible that the students might be presented one um, and then asked to you know, get some information from it. Uh, but I doubt that there would be some sort of intentional um, effort to try and put this on the exam. Again, if I'm putting myself in the test writer's um, shoes and I get basically nine questions that I can ask, you know, nine parts uh, to cover basically the whole class. Um, I'm probably not spending one part on a mosaic plot. Now that doesn't mean it, it couldn't be there, um, but uh, I wouldn't be something I'd, you know, spend a lot of time emphasizing just because it's new. I also see that there's been a few questions about um, motivating seniors. Uh, and or motivating students in general. Um, and I wish I had a great uh, answer to that. Um, but what I think plays the best with my students is not focusing so much on the, you know, passing the exam and getting the college credit, but focusing on the fact that so many students will need an understanding of statistics to do well in their other courses. Uh, and I, you know, I get emails from students, uh, former students all the time saying, hey, I'm in anthropology class, I'm in chemistry class, I'm in nursing class or wherever, and nobody else knows what a p-value is, but I do, you know, thanks, Mr. Tabor. Um, and so I think that's the most motivational thing for students is that they actually are going to use this. Um, in almost every major that you would go into, you're going to use this. Uh, and so studying for an AP exam uh, is a way to make sure that students get the big concepts and get the big ideas um, and can, can put that package together in a way that they'll be able to remember it for the future. So I think it's worth the effort, uh, regardless of how their AP score comes out, it's worth the effort because they're gonna need it later uh, when they go on to college. If I could just jump on the tail end of Josh's comment, I absolutely agree. And if there's ever a time when statistics is important to humanity and to society in general, I think we're in it. Uh, anyone who's been following the coronavirus pandemic has heard about clinical trials and the need to test against a placebo and not just give a few people a, a drug and see how it goes. Um, the importance of randomized trials has been in the news daily. Uh, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks, who've been frequent spokespeople about this, have, uh, have really made it clear that 
Uh, it's going to take some time to figure this stuff out. Uh, so actually in class tomorrow, we're doing uh, a problem based on uh, one of the testing procedures that's had some data about false positive and false negative rates. Um, now we need technology to do that because the calculations are a little messy, but uh, for us at least, trying to step away from the syllabus for a minute and keep it real. Uh, what the kids care about right now is health and safety and their family and what, what's going on in the world. And uh, you know, we debated how they would feel about us talking about coronavirus, but if we do it from a scientific standpoint, they're kind of used to us doing that with other things, uh, you know, including sex and drugs and other stuff. Uh, we do it from a, from a data point of view. Uh, it just seems to me like this is a really good time for statistics. Yeah, I, I think was thinking really exactly good. the same uh, thing, Darren. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea um, to keep them connected and, and keep them uh, motivated by doing things that, that really do keep it real um, and keep it close because um, that's what they care about. Um, that's where their world is right now. Um, we do have a couple more questions. If you guys are good with answering another question about binomial and geometric probability calculation. Um, so when we do those, do something um, like those, we often have to check the conditions for that distribution. Do we need to do that? Um, so in the past on probability questions, uh, specifically binomial questions, um, unless their students are asked to justify that it's a binomial distribution, we are just thrilled, thrilled that kids recognize that it's a binomial situation and can then execute the, the calculations correctly. Um, so in a, just a, a probability question where it's a binomial distribution, they've never been required to, you know, state that it's binary and independent and fixed number of trials and same probability of success. Um, but they have had to so, uh, show work in the sense of either showing the formula or being very careful to define the distribution by stating it's binomial with n equals five and p equals 0.7 uh, or whatever. So the communication needs to be there, but not the, the check of the conditions. One thing students do need to be able to do is to define the random variable, um, or I would even go on to say defining parameters in an inference setting. That's traditionally been hard for students to do in a binomial setting or a geometric setting to say what the, the variable uh, that they might be calling X or Y, what exactly does that represent? The number of what? And um, I know that in the past, sometimes uh, students have been asked to do that and, and in general, they've struggled. Uh, so that might be a worthwhile skill to practice that uh, isn't just a stock interpretation uh, that, that might, it might show up. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good point. Um, one last question, just kind of, um, it looks like things have slowed down a little bit. So uh, one last question relating to kind of your speculation about parts. Trevor did say that, um, that students can still earn, earn a five um, and not finish all of the questions or all of the parts of the question. Um, does this make you think that maybe there could be more than nine parts? Um, or do you think that will be kind of factored in with, um, you know, the way the scoring works out? Just a speculation, um, and that is in the past, uh, most years it's between, you know, you need between 65 and 75% uh, percent of the points to get a five, uh, depending on the, the relative difficulty of the questions. Um, so I would just think the same logic would apply, um, that, you know, if it is out of nine points, you know, getting a six or a seven out of nine uh, might earn you a five, um, depending on the difficulty of the questions and the stringency of the rubrics and uh, they have, you know, processes that they go through to uh, to do that grade setting. Um, it'll, be, it'll obviously be different this year uh, than most years. Um, but I think that was encouraging. And I'm glad Trevor said that because I know um, at the beginning of the year, students in my class often feel really stressed if they're, you know, if they get less than 90% correct on a raw score, or if they know they missed one question, they feel like they're doomed. Um, but that's really not true. Um, that uh, you don't have to get 100% to get a five. And a, a good reminder to tell your students is, if there's a hard question on this year's exam, well, it's gonna be hard for everyone. Uh, and the people who write the question and decide on the grades, they'll know it was hard. Um, and all that gets accounted for uh, when they decide what score uh, students need to get to get a five, four, three, two, or one. Yep. Uh, we just got a, uh, uh 
comment here from Tamara. I, I love it. Um, you all gave me so much confidence as a, uh, as a teacher this year. So um, thank you very much for all you guys have done and, and what you guys have uh, said. Uh, Peter Belita, our, the president of Texas Instruments logged in tonight, uh, Texas Instruments wow. Education logged in tonight. And he says, uh, probability and stats in the hands of people who understand mathematics will make our world a better place. Thanks to the teachers uh, who are doing their part for, uh, for those students. So um, Peter's here and, and also expressed his uh, appreciation for everything. Um, so anyway, I, I want to, um, I think that wraps up most of what we've got here. Lots of appreciation from lots of different people. So Darren and Josh, I want to pass that along to you guys. Um, and lastly, um, I just want to encourage everyone else out there to go ahead and uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel to get some uh, some alerts uh, about this or other office hours that we may do. Um, I know there was a question if there'll be another follow-up to this one. Um, we'll kind of monitor the situation and make a decision uh, based on that. So um, thank you guys very much. And uh, Robin, thank you for joining us as well and organize all of this. Thank you, Robin. Um, and, My pleasure. Uh, yeah, this was, this was really, really great. So always fun. Tell everyone good night. Um, and so See you. Stay healthy, everyone.